Vote for the Monster Rainy Looney Party. Vote for insanity. Vote Looney. Come on, turn on, <laughs> tune in, drop out <laughs> with me. Maybe you need a break, so let's just run away. The worst possible thing anybody can say to me, really, is don't think you can do that. And it's like, yes, it's great, get it, yeah. And people will say to me, but you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do this. And I say, show me the rule book where it says that I have to be this and do this. So Christmas will be every four years. Vote for insanity. You know it makes sense. I've never been wrong in my life. The rest of the world is wrong. Mm. Buenos dias. Two is getting to nothing. Yeah. Okay. Darling. We will find the little meadow high up in the cascades. Baby, we I never knew such security before I gave up money. And do you think Bill Gates is more secure than I am? I'd start doing what I want to do, when I want to do, and lay about and just do as I please, really. They sent Webster to show the painting. See, I have an ability, and it's magical. Magic does exist, and it's not just with the magician that you see. This is an animal doing it. Bless you, bless you, my ladies. I stepped to the beat of a different drummer. A quote from Walt Whitman. Turn on, tune in, drop out with me. My name is Daniel Suelo, and I haven't earned or spent a single cent in 14 years, and I live totally without money. I've actually been sleeping in caves longer than I've lived without money, probably since the mid-90s. This here is one of my sleeping places. Use cardboard for a pad, works great. When I had a job, a respectable job in town, I decided I didn't want to pay rent anymore and live outdoors. So I, I've lived in caves all up and down these canyons. And this over here is a place where I sit and I, yeah, I have an extra blanket here that I use if it's really cold, but I have to sit here and relax. I bring books up for magazines that I find and read them. I'm collecting some onions. These are wild onions. Just eat the tops for like chives or get the whole bulb if you want to do some good cooking with it. I really do feel that wild edibles are a lot more nutritious than domestic. I think in domestication, we, we domesticate or breed for more for flavor or for a sweetness rather than nutrition. <laughs> Delicious. This here is the kitchen. I've eaten lizards around here and grasshoppers and ants. One time I found a raccoon down at the road, freshly killed and brought him up and cooked it. Okay, now I'm gonna saute the onions and potatoes in this pan with some oil. There's like fat squirrels everywhere and deer, but I actually don't feel comfortable killing anything when there's so much getting thrown away. There's like fresh meat thrown away all the time in the dumpsters. I find that it's really rare that I get sick when I'm living outdoors. The only times I've gotten sick from dumpsters is if I've eaten too much sweets, but I've never gotten like dysentery from a dumpster. I've never like vomited or whatever from a dumpster. It was really hard for me to, to deal with when I first gave up money was being on the receiving end of charity because often it's condescending. The giver is the superior one, the taker is the inferior one. 
library is kind of like my office and my living room. <laughs> um, yeah, I come here to work on my blog and do emails. And there are some valid points about using the library when it's paid for by taxes. And it's the one exception to my rule that I, I don't take government assistance. I've foregone everything else. I don't take food stamps. I don't go to the food bank. This is the closest way I know to publish ideas for free. It's an amazing time we're living in. I can write blogs and publish them f to the whole world in a website that no one has to pay for. <laughs> I like Moab and I, I really love the people. There's a certain mentality that's attracted to Moab. It's a mentality that doesn't like the system and is open to alternatives. My town camp, for when I don't have time to go up the canyon, I have stuff going on in town, I stay here. And it's pretty primitive. I prefer staying up the canyon. This is kind of like a, my classic hobo camp. <laughs> <laughs> Christianity, the Bible is very important to me, and I do feel like it influenced my life deeply. My father, he became a minister of a church. My mother, she got us reading the Bible a lot growing up. I taught them God's Word. I just believed that this is what I was supposed to do. He was a good thinker, even as a child. And, uh, but what, what I think about Sartre on the life he's in now, I don't know, it just uh, seems to work into it. My roommates and my friends were constantly challenging my conservative religious beliefs. And I was hearing the usual from the family. College is corrupting Daniel. That's actually where I felt like I rejected my faith when I was in the Peace Corps. In a lot of ways, I uh, thought of myself as some kind of, like, I'm here to set Christianity straight because it's off the it's off the path. Why is it that we're not following the teachings of Jesus? Like why is it that we just worship this icon but don't actually practice these things? Yeah, I, I feel like we should stop worrying and live like birds. That's basically a paraphrase of the Sermon on the Mount. The birds don't worry and they don't carry around possessions and they don't worry about money, and they get everything they need. I'm employed by the universe. Since everywhere I go is the universe, I'm always secure. Life has flourished for billions of years like this. I never knew such security before I gave up money. Wealth is what we are dependent upon for security, and my wealth never leaves me. I'm Darla Shaw. I don't think I'm an eccentric. My mother was a beautiful, petite, little size four woman. And she said to me, you know, Darla, you never got my looks. You inherited your looks from your father. You're not going to be able to rely on your looks. You're going to have to develop a personality. And, OK, and I think I did. My father 
told me everyone is not going to like you, but the most important thing is that you like yourself. And then you can be anything you want to be. Darla, also known and dubbed as Dr. D, and Ben, dubbed as Gentle Ben, have indicated that they want to renew their wedding vows hobo style. This is Ben. We've been married for way over 50 years. I'm with her. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't have been able to even do this today w without his help. I mean, it, it's been an amazing uh, 50 years. We've had our ups and downs, but boy, the ups, particularly when you're older, are wonderful. It really is. When I saw her, her name had to be Kobe. I mean, it's just the type of thing when you look at somebody you know. I was almost name. named Snowball. Okay. And my son's name is Dyke. You'll never forget their name. Once you meet Kobe and once you meet Dyke, you'll never, never, ever forget him. So we're glad that I was named Kobe and he was named Dyke. Because, I mean, you know, at that time we thought it was this big, strong, bold name. And then one day we were at a ski area and we said, hey, Dyke. And the whole line at the ski area stopped and everything. I love skiing, and I did not like ski jackets. They were big and bulky, and I saw this fireman's coat, so I started wearing it as a ski jacket, and I just grow, grew very attached to it, so I don't wear the usual clothes. You will see closets and closets of clothes, but not one designer label. Clothes speak to me in a certain way. I get up in the morning, and I feel a certain way. I can't express how I feel, but I can go to a piece of clothing, and that piece of clothing will say, this is your day, this is what you need to wear. Roach does no wet in the car, turned its head and moved. I put my bucket down underneath and sat down on my stool. I was looking at the back end of a bull, he was looking back at me. People will say to me, you know, Darla, your friends, they're really weird. And I say, well, the reason they're weird is because I'm weird. Okay, so we got, we got, we got guys here. If I tell people I'm in a documentary on eccentrics, they think an eccentric is somebody weird, not productive, and somebody that you don't want to associate with. But in my age group, it is so routine how you are supposed to act. It's almost like there's a rule book and people will say to me, but you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do this. And I say, where is the rule book? Show me the rule book where it says that I have to be this and do this. Ladies, just act normal, please. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, Marty, thank you for coming today. I am just so excited about the success of your new book about Raven and Ravy. Well, Tell me, you. how did you decide to write this book? What motivated you? The um, Ravens just were so stately, so magnificent, and they make the most marvelous sounds. Ooh, I bet you could make a raven sound. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> so you notice them. I notice the Raven Sad. Yes. Right. Okay. Wow. So what do you think Zadig started to do? Making hats. He started to make hats. He was the first hat maker. We are standing here beside the grave of Maggie, the beloved wife of Yanai. Now, unlike so many of the residents of Ridgefield back in the 1800s. Yanai and Maggie were not natives. Okay, it's gimmicky, but sometimes the gimmicks can make a difference. They really can. In the Danbury school system, the third graders learn about the history of Danbury, which is so rich. The students were so bored with it. There was nothing really happening. And then I came upon the idea of kids love ghosts, that you can take a historical story, you can make it, you know, a, it's really kind of a ghost story, but kind of embellish it a little, and boy, you've 
got those kids in your grasp. <laughs> he wept and wept as he followed the blood-stained walkway. My husband and I are uh, professional jugglers. We have a comedy juggling variety show. Yeah, and we perform all over the country. I've had some unusual jobs, and a lot of them stem from going to Clown College, and that is definitely something that would not have happened without my parents' support and willingness to let me do those things. They didn't tell me I was crazy when I said I wanted to go to Clown College or I was applying, and, and I definitely appreciate that looking back. I figure whenever you expand your horizons and learn anything, I mean, it's going to be something special. The deal was, when I retired, Darla was going to continue to work. And continuing to work, you know, she, she has her responsibilities. And I said, OK, I'll take care of the house. Ben's the cook in the family. And I'm a no cook. I don't even know how to shop at the supermarket. And she has her world, and I have my world, and, um, and it works out. I'm 73 years old, and I'm still playing hockey. The secret to staying youthful, I think it's the people that you associate with. Also, um, keeping yourself physically and mentally in condition. Who inspires me? My wife, Darla. If it wasn't for her, and her persistence and her support, I don't know where I'd have been today. I love music, I absolutely love it. I took accordion lessons, I found another accordion player, and I said, I'm starting a band because I'm not gonna practice if I have no reason to practice. And people thought I was nuts. We're a family band. I mean, we don't care if you screw up. We don't care if you play the wrong note. We're there for the right reasons. I have never been bored in my entire life. I hear people all around me saying, oh, I'm bored with this, I'm bored. How can you be bored? There are so many options. There are so many things to do. And things happen for a reason in life. And I hope when things happen, you say, wow, why did that happen to me? You jump on it, because that's when the best things happen. I do have, uh, hopefully, longevity, and I'm just going to make the most of whatever I have. I'm never going to stop setting goals. If I'm in assisted living, if I'm hooked up to IV, I'll still be thinking about what I can do, where I can go, how I can make the most of something. Vote for Lord Toby Judd. Vote for the official Monster, 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 Looney Party. Vote Looney. My name's Lord Toby Judd, and I'm not an eccentric. It's the rest of the world that's eccentric. Oh, hello. How are you? Vote Looney. Have another million pound notes. I actually started in 1987. I saw this advertisement for the Monster Raving Looney Party, I thought. You know, what's, what's this? It's the monster, because it, it, it was totally unique at the time. We're going to do away with January and February, um, so we can have a shorter winter. And I think that's an ideal, ideal uh, policy, because obviously it's going to save in health charges. Uh, we're, we're very concerned for the elderly. It's going to save the heating and all, all, all that goes with that. I, I thought, Eureka, this sounds like... Uh my type of thing. We shall have Christmas every four years. It's far too commercial, far too expensive, and far too loony. So Christmas will be every four years. Vote for insanity. You know it makes sense. Well, how, how could you define loony? I mean, to me, it's not loony. It may be to you or other people. To me, it's not. You know, our policies over the years, have, uh, to me, are just common sense. You know, in the introduction of fluorescent dog food, so you don't tread in it to, at night, because it's glowing, you know, it's just common sense. And same with classroom sizes. We reduced the classroom sizes by putting all the desks and the kids moving them closer together. Everywhere you go, everyone's jogging mad. You know, what jog, jog, jog. So why don't we get all these joggers, 
that are running around and put them on a giant conveyor belt that generates electricity, and then we can use that to generate free electricity for the old people. You know, it's just common sense at the end of the day. Voting loony makes sense. I'm not eccentric. I, I'm quite normal. It's all the other people that are eccentric. And there's plenty of them in these straight suits, collars and ties. They're the eccentric ones. I'd done some research into Screaming Lord Such and found out that he was a rock star. One of the first shock horror musicians. And it was just totally unique, and no one had ever seen this. Jack the Ripper was his best known song. He played it for laughs. He, I don't think, ever sat down and looked at the implications of promoting a, slot, a song about murdering women. Well, he walks down the street. Every gal he meets, he says his young name, Mary Kelly. To him, it was just an act, and everybody knew it was an act. It was so over the top that he just couldn't associate that with, with real life. Screaming Lord Such, the greatest showman, in my opinion, in rock entertaining. OK, the man couldn't sing. He was a rock and roll screamer. <laughs> Unfortunately, chart success eluded him because the BBC, in their infinite wisdom, decided that his records were too outlandish and not for those of a nervous disposition. So all his records was banned and never got played any airtime. David's second life in the limelight began when his rock and roll career was on the wane. He was a regular sight to be seen at all of the by-elections, general elections that, that went on. Unfailingly unsuccessful, but unfailingly the winner in the publicity stakes at, it, at each of them. I want to be elected. I've been trying for since 1963. So I've been trying all these years, and I first uh, put up policies that votes at 18, when you couldn't vote until you were 21. That has become law. Uh, and he also advocated uh, knighthoods for the Beatles, that became law. And I, I also put up for local and commercial radio stations, because BBC had the monopoly, and now we've got that. And we advocated passports for pets. Now that's law, so you can bring your, your animal into this country thanks to the Monster Raven Looney Party. So not all our policies are daft. The Looney Party will live on, and we've got 35 candidates <laughs> that's ready to take action on Parliament. David Such was found hanged at his home in north-west London yesterday afternoon. He had fought a long-term battle against depression. Political leaders may rise and fall in popularity, but Screaming Lord Such remained a unique national treasure. Elections without him will never quite be the same. He did poke fun at the establishment in a way that reminded everybody that uh, they should be cut down to size once in a while. I was just totally flabbergasted and shocked, as, as were the whole party, and uh, I think most of the country was, uh, because, as I say, he was out, outwardly flamboyant. You'd, You'd think he would be the last person to, to, to do this, but uh, sadly he did. I always said to Dave Such that uh, if anything ever happened to him, then I would carry on the party legacy and his legacy, and, and that's what I've done. Vote for insanity. Vote, vote, Lord Toby Jones. Vote monster, 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 raving, loony, party! I'm Gary Holloway, and I'm proud to be an eccentric. I step to the beat of a different drummer. A quote from Walt Whitman. Always step to the beat of a different drummer, no matter what the cadence or how far away that you hear that different drummer. And that was a motto I picked up and used through many, many decades of my life, that, sure, the drummer I hear is not what everybody hears, but I don't care. It's my, my call in life. It's my drummer. 
Well, welcome to uh, San Francisco. And we're going to have a great day here exploring the city and some of our most famous uh, eccentric characters. Here we are, one of the most historic spots in San Francisco. And the importance of this hill is you could see downtown to the village of San Francisco. You could also see out to the Golden Gate, the same view we have today. I'm very gregarious. I love people. Kind of the Will Rogers, I never met a man I didn't like. Sometimes maybe I don't feel particularly like I want to do the walk, but the minute I get there, it's like curtain going up, I'm on stage. Hi, folks, welcome to our walk. We're going to be walking for two hours here in the neighborhood where Enrico Caruso lived or Emperor Norton walked. And then a friend of mine said that she was going to make a robe. She felt that I had the bearing of a priest or a monk from the Middle Ages. I've been wearing it for years on flights, on bus trips, Halloween. I get interesting reactions. A lot of people want to confess sins. <laughs> people give me seats on buses and planes. And because I used to fly a lot with it, I used to be known as a frequent friar. Oh. oh. I had a woman say one time, you have the perfect life. You live alone, you have your own home, you can be with people when you want to, but when you don't need to, you can shut out the world and you can have your own sanctuary, your own place away from the madding crowd. Okay, well, come on in. Oh, here's a little friend. Yeah, come on in and we'll talk about my many collections here in the Peanuts room. I became infatuated with Peanuts and the characters, uh, Charlie Brown and Linus and Lucy and so forth, and of course Snoopy, world's most famous beagle dog. And I always felt that there was a real uh, connection between me and Charlie Brown who was kind of naive but eccentric in his own way. And this is kind of how I think about a lot of things in life. I felt unique. I felt different from the rest of the family. My father was very vindictive, very physically abusive. My mother, on the other hand, was very soft and tender. And she said to me when I was about 10, she said, you've always had a little glint in your eye that none of the other five sons have ever had. And that gave me kind of empowerment, made me feel really good. This is a bed I've had since I was quite young, even preteens. It's followed me around to three or four different states during my life. Um, it's a little bit broken in, because I'm a chunky kind of guy, but uh, I still love it, it's comfortable. When I get into that bed at night, it's a nice, nurturing, like back to the womb feeling. I think my father was trying to get me into some sort of mold that he perceived was necessary with the other five brothers. And I wasn't balking so much as just not interested in being one of the gang, you know, being part of the cookie cutter, uh, you know, mentality for the family. This is my lair. This is my habitat. This is my retreat, my sanctuary. And come on with me. I'm going to show you another couple of collections that are just down the hallway. Okay, well, let me show you my tea tin collection. I'm very proud of it, to say the least. I have about 1,500. It's been authenticated as the world's largest collection, focusing on tea and tea culture. I haven't bought all these. I've had friends donate them, but I have drunk most of the tea here over the years. When I was a freshman in college, I met a wonderful lady. Uh, she was 42, returning into college, and she said she liked to get mail and loved to send postcards, and I said, me too. And that's how we started. This correspondence of a postcard every day, including Sundays, lasted for 52 years. So I treasure these. I have over 20,000 postcards from her. Why do you travel? As I travel for adventure, for knowledge. Um, I visited over 120 different countries. And I'm considered an American eccentric when I go to Southeast Asia. I bet. In I fact, bet. Uh, people always ask me, are, are other Americans like you? What we have here, a couple of images of one of my favorite saints, Saint Fioc. Well, he became the patron saint of gardeners. Also because he crouched and got down a lot, he developed hemorrhoids. So he is also the patron saint of hemorrhoid sufferers. Very interesting uh, saint. I have heroes like Martin Van Buren, who I really admire for his individuality, his steadfastness. I went to the United States Mint to buy a set of medals of all the presidents. And she said, there's one medal I've never sold by itself, the Martin Van Buren medal. Nobody seems to be interested in our eighth president. 
And I said, I'll take 10 of those. And she goes, what? And then she yelled into the next room, I'm selling 10 Van Burens. And the response came back, that's incredible. Nobody ever buys Van Burens. Uh, so he was widowed and he never remarried. Did a lot of, I think, chasing skirts. He was particularly fond of ballerinas, but because they were nimble and athletic, they could always outrun him. I would say he was eccentric. He's the derivation of the term OK. He's from the village of Kinderhook in upstate New York. His rallying cry of all of his campaigns was, I'm old Kinderhook. And that expression was shortened by the Democratic Party to he's OK, which is probably the most famous saying anywhere in the world. So we always say, I'm OK. That's part of our message as the Martin Van Buren fan club. OK, well, welcome all to the 38th annual Martin Van Buren birthday dinner and seance. And this is Martin Van Buren's 232nd birthday. Wow. So he can't be with us tonight. He wishes he could. We're going to go into the business uh, meeting. Uh, this is the one I, I fear. This first order of business every year is the election of the president of the club. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that I have won for 30 some years in a row should not be um, daunting to anybody or discouraging. But um, what we always look for is somebody to make a motion that I am to be elected for the next year. Nomination. I'd like to make a motion. Yes, please. To uh, uh, nominate and uh, elect uh, uh, Gary Holloway as the next president of the Martin Van Buren fan club. I'll I'll second. Oh, will you? Okay, then moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye, 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 aye. Okay, any naysayers? Okay, thank you for the vote of confidence again. This is the 38th annual Marty Award. And of course, the uh, Marty Award is given to the person in the previous year who has done the most for the club. Well, this is like the Academy Awards. My fingers are trembling as I open. And oh, the winner is me. Well, I certainly think Gary's an eccentric in the very best sense of the word. There is a, a, high, uh, a relatively high degree of motivation and focus on things that most of us would just say, that's trivial. Why are you putting so much time and energy into that? You know, but an eccentric will do that. Welcome to the annual seance, which we always end our Martin Van Buren potluck uh, evenings with. Uh, the seance is to call on the spirit of Martin Van Buren to answer a number of questions which we pose for him every year. <laughs> if it's a positive response, the candle will flicker and move. If it's a negative, the candle will stay steady. <clears throat> this has always proven to be 100% accurate over the years, <laughs> and there'll be no difference tonight for that. Right. Are, Are you okay? Oh my God, we're getting some nice spirits here. Right. I'm really hard pressed to think of anything that Martin <laughs> Van Buren ever did. <laughs> and that is in itself interesting. I mean, that makes him unique. And so I, it, it's actually been a very good experience to be a part of the organization. The question, of course, has to do with Martin Van Buren's private life about Dolly Madison woman he was uh, very much, um, I think, in love with. And the question is, did you dally with Dolly? Did you dally with Dolly? Ooh. Oh my God. Well, well, well. Dally, huh? More than once, apparently. <laughs> well, I would say, yes. The knowledge this man has that he shares with us to make every evening with him or every field trip with him um, an experience you don't want to forget. But along the street here on Market Street and around on New Montgomery, there was a real character, an eccentric, named Oofty Goofty. And he got that name because that was the sound he made. And sometimes he would have a little set of bars, like uh, wooden bars that he'd carry with him, and then he would put it up uh, in front of him, and he'd pretend that he was the wild man of Borneo. And he would hold on to the bars, and he would make these sounds, and he'd go, Oofty Goofty. Well, How'd he make his money and survive? He would charge you 25 cents and you could kick him. 50 cents, you can hit him with a cane. And for 75 cents, a baseball bat. He also had um, an adversarial role with John L. Sullivan, who was the uh, world's champion heavyweight at the time. And none other than John L. Sullivan hit him in the back and broke his spinal column, oh. cracked a couple of ribs. Oh. And that was the end of Oofty Goofty's career. Very strange character that was here. So come on along. We'll look at some other spots connected with him. Yeah. And, and I think uh, you'll be pleased to hear more about him. I'm Nora 
Laura K. Prophet, Vancouver's Deck Lady. Yes, hello. Uh, Shirley, yes, this is the Deck Lady. For the past 21 years, I've lived in a Vancouver hotel room with a series of five ducks. I love them all like children. The first duck I lived with, I called Harvey the Duck. Harvey, he's the holy duck. Literally a holy duck. <laughs> uh, God was showing us this in every way. I didn't plan on it. I was on the bus going somewhere I don't know where. All of a sudden, my spirit voice's male said, get off the bus here. And I saw that I was, there was a hatchery right across the street. And he said, go in, you're going to get a duck. And I'm getting one of those too, so oh, don't jump. the jumper is probably mine. He was the most sweetest, wonderful little guy. Harvey never hurt another animal. He got along with every animal, dog, cat, you name it. He literally behaved like a human being. And you could say, what's your name? He'd say, Harv. And who's that? Mom. And if you gave him a treat, he'd wag his tail and say, whoa. Harvey had a special ability. He could heal people. One day, he met an eight-year-old girl. She had mittens on, and I said, do you want to hold Harvey the duck? He can pet him. The dad said she's got these sores on the back of her hand for three months. The doctors couldn't do anything about it. I did not say anything about Harvey being able to heal them. All I said was, Harvey's a magic duck. Wishes come true off his feathers. You just pat him, and you wish whatever you want. And the mother phoned me the next morning, and she said, you know, we woke up, and these, her hands were perfectly healed. And I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. And the little girl said, no, Mom, it was Harvey the duck that healed me. <laughs> the child knew. And when Harvey died, like, I, I, I was like in shock. Now, it was interesting because after he had died, I had a couple of psychics say, I see Harvey, he's dressed in the black suit, and he's just a big traveler, and he's happy as all get up. After Harvey died, I was given two other ducks whom I called Webster and Holly. Webster, Holly. I discovered that Webster had a special talent. He could paint pictures. There you go, darling. Okay, Webster's going to paint. And Webster painted perfect pictures of exactly what we asked for. They're incredibly detailed. But there, he had little bumps on his feet, on his toes, so that when he did pictures, it was like ink blot art. And I said, you're going to paint such and such. Yo, 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 he'd go, and I'd stand him on the paint and then stand him on the canvas, and he'd walk around on for like less than two minutes. He'd always do a tiny little piddle to put his self into it. All the media attention I had got me into a lot of trouble where I lived. I had to give up Webster and Holly. Soon after, I was evicted and had to live on the street. I was 51, I was very sick, and it was getting cold at night, so I had the big garbage bags. And believe me, when you see yourself climbing into that garbage bag, you know you're nothing. You're garbage. I'm sorry. When I came down with the multiple sclerosis, I would be walking down the street and all of a sudden my legs would collapse up from under me. And I didn't understand what was going on and I would sit there until I could walk again. And as the multiple sclerosis got worse and more often I was falling down and sitting there on the street, all of a sudden it's like people were kicking dirt at me and people were putting their ashes from the cigarettes on top of me and spitting on me as I was sitting there waiting to get my strength back. 
and I couldn't understand why were they doing this? What? And saying, ah, oh, she's some damn drunk or she's some damn, you're drug addict, get off the drugs, go out and get a job. And God does not let me hit. All my life I have never been able to hit or scream to this day. When I, everything in me wants to hit. My life started to improve when I got another special duck called Bobby. Don't look, just reach in and take one fast. And good luck, open them up. With Bobby, I raised money for my charity, Duck Soup. Over the years, I've given out over $25,000 to homeless people. It's like a lottery. The street people win varying amounts of money hidden in small packages of cookies. I do everything myself. Yeah, I buy, uh, I buy them retail, I cook them, I deliver them, all of it. It's all my money. The $100 winners are the super duck. The $50 winners are the lucky duckies. The people on the street, they especially want money because they want to buy what they want to buy with it. And I, I really felt bad when I hear people saying, well, what are you going to do with this money? It's none of their business. If you win a million dollars, who's to tell? Why, why should we care what you spend is on? You can spend it on whatever you want. You can throw it away on silly things or give it away to people. Or There was one guy who had won money and he threw it out to the public. He was like me, wants to make people feel good. And when you're making them feel good, it makes you feel good. I got it too. Two is better than nothing. Yep. Okay, Thank you, bye. I wanted them to feel like a winner, even if it's a damn one or two dollars. People couldn't understand why would I be giving away my money when I didn't have anything myself. They didn't understand. I wanted to make these people feel, raise their self-esteem and make them feel happy. And it's like a draw, it's like an excitement. And they're not paying for anything. They're not buying a ticket. They're, I just come up unexpectedly and this is it. Eight dollars. You got eight. Wow, eight dollars, good one. Thank you. Okay, good congratulations. He got eight dollars, who's next? When Bobby died, it hit me very hard. Because she was a duck soup duck, but she was also my life. She was my friend, my companion, my business partner. She was everything. She was all I had. Is there in this box right here? Oh, they're in the box. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I so, thought they'd be running around in it. Well, oh. we just brought some here to you. And these are all just one day old. Uh, they were hatched yesterday, yes. Yeah. So they See, look who's in the center with the neck stretching lungs. Yeah, that's right. There you See? go. See? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is Bobby. I know this is Bobby. Yeah. Are you a jumper? Because my Bobbies are usually jumpers. Yeah. Oh, you're such a sweet little baby. Hello, Bobby. Hey. You say bye-bye. Say bye-bye, guys. Yeah. We need another life. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. Yep, that's it. My big yawn. You're tired, but you're not going to give in to it, are you? Because there's too much going on. The little wings. The little wings out. Yes, you make so many people happy. You do. You put a smile on their face. And for a little bit, they forget about their problems and they feel happier and they've got something to tell, a story to tell their friends that they saw a baby duck and they touched a baby duck. Yeah, you are so special. You just make them so happy.
long does it take to fry an egg? Because some people, they put them on, they wander off, don't they? They do do. Yeah, so I thought to myself, why not? I thought, bring the world's first frying pan musical. And it's his choice of tunes. I went to this place and I said, we've run out of coat hooks. There's so many people here that, you know, we've literally run out of coat hooks. Okey cokey. Have your own coat hook. Just a normal conventional door knocker. But by swivelling the head round, it's rubber ended. So if you're expecting Jehovah's Witnesses to come, you can turn that round and you can say, in all honesty, rather than open the door, I didn't hear them. They haven't rung yet to say how many they want, but I know the order's on the way. It was failure that sort of, if I may be so bold as to say, that came into success, if you get my, if you want to call it success. But we did the serious, what I call the serious stuff years ago, you know, you're plodding away, you know, you're sending off your ideas and rejections, and I thought, oh. So one day I thought, what the heck am I doing, you know? So I spun it on its head completely, and I thought, I'll do the things I want to do, you know, as simple as that. I'm glad you've asked me about this. I it, didn't. So anyway, this is basically a dummy or a soother, whatever. This is for ugly children. So when you clamp it in their face, you know, you can't see them, bless. As my mother said, I think you were born with a hammer in your hand. I said, it must have been painful, mother. You put the charcoal in the bottom. Ah, yeah, it comes ah. from the Greek meaning bottom. Ah. And uh, you set fire to it and you sit there and you can slowly barbecue your food. It's the personal barbecue. Anyway, it don't matter wherever you go, there's always someone saying, where can I buy one of these? You know, and you think, oh my God, and they got a vote as well. It was a green thing, you know, he recycles. Then all of a sudden the press sort of look at it from another angle, and you know, and all of a sudden you're reborn again. You're a wacky inventor, gosh, please, please. This is a tunnel, right? right. They always, all these people, where we can't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Wrong! Flick the switch and you are in total control and you can see the light at the end of your tunnel whenever you want. <laughs> the way I, I'm looking at it, I mean, this could be the next big money spinner. Mind you, there hasn't been one before it, but this could be the next one, you know, please. Well, he said, you're leaving us today. He said, you're going to find that things out there in the real world, he said, are totally different from here. He said, you'll find that there is no place out there for your kind of stupidity. And wouldn't I like to meet him now and say, I think you got that wrong, sunshine. What no. on earth is happening here? Well, this is a bra warmer. No, on a, on a cold morning, you get up and put it on this, and away you go. Right. Once it's maintained the heat, yeah. as we're getting there, and then put it straight on. Well, as you can see, there is a bra on it. It belongs to the beautiful Kerry. If Kerry could come in and just stand here. Oh, no, not that way, Kerry. <laughs> oh, I should shut one no, eye. Please, everyone, avert your gaze. <laughs> Kerry, if you could just turn around. We've got your bra. We're gonna, I'm going to ask you to put it on, uh, and you tell me whether the... Uh, the bra warmer has actually worked. There you go. <laughs> oh, it's lovely and toasty. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're going to be envy of all the ladies here. So do you think it's going to catch on? Would you use one of these it at home? It will. There's nothing worse than a cold bra. Really? Yes. I feel rather than chip the finish, we can use a safety net. Saves it hitting the floor, don't you think? I got the idea from the circus. Trapeze artist, you see. Well, he's mad, but he's happy. The worst possible thing anybody can say to me, really, is, don't think you can do that. And it's like, yeah, it's great, get it, yeah. So that's how it goes, really. The only reliant three-wheeled fire engine in the world. And this part of Lincolnshire as well. Talk amongst yourselves while I unwrap it. So we've got the blue lights, the bell, all the bits and bobs. I then cut the back off. Does it run? Good okay. God, does it run? I mean, come on. Where do you think you are? A bloody museum? If it's not got going, keep it going till I get there. Otherwise, it's a pointless escapade, isn't it, really, you know? 
The reaction on people's faces has, has been wonderful. It doesn't cost any more to snarl or smile. You know, the same effort's involved. But if you get small, I think you're halfway there. <laughs> Come on, live. You only get one stab at life. If it's not video, you can't press the replay button. A lot think they can, but it don't work that way. So, as I once said famously, I'm trying to cram as much silliness in as I possibly can, and it's working for me. Fade to credits. Thank you, yes. I looked around and I just felt like people seem unhappier here than they in Ecuador. Here everything's just so manicured and fake. And I'd go into grocery stores and freak out. There's just too many choices and everything's consume, consume, consume. It was all just too much for me. It was just like I can't handle this. And my depression just kept felt like it kept getting worse. I didn't see how it could get any worse, but it just kept, I kept sinking more and more and um, thinking more and more about suicide a lot. And I thought, something's wrong. I can't handle being alive anymore. It's just impossible. So that weekend, I drove up to Mount Evans in Colorado to check out cliffs. <laughs> so I went up the road a ways and did a Yui, and then gunned the gas. The last thing I remembered, the edge of the cliff hitting the floorboard of the car. Then it was just blackness after that. I opened my eyes, I didn't feel anything, it was just numbness. But I looked up and it, everything was red. The blood was in my eyeballs. And I remember thinking, oh shit, I'm still alive. And then I just remember blacking out again. And then the next thing I remembered, I woke up and I was at the side of the road. And I was like, wow, how did I get up here? If I heard this car coming down from the summit. And I kept going back and forth between wanting to live and wanting to die. And as he got closer, I was thinking, I don't want to see him, want him to see him, me here. I just want to die. And I hope he passes me by. Sure enough, he passed me by and went on. And as he went by, I remember thinking, that fucker, <laughs> what's the matter with people? <laughs> and then I started praying that somebody would come and find me. And sure enough, another car was coming down. And I was like praying that it would stop, and then he stops. And I just blanked out again. I didn't understand at first why in the world uh, he wanted to commit suicide. One reason was is he he uh, he was gay. Uh, he is gay. He's a, a gay person, and he and he knew that I, I've always been pretty strict about morals and all this sort of thing, you know. And I think it uh, he was afraid that the family might disown him. He'd always told us all of his kids that he had unconditional love for us. But he said, you know, uh, honestly, a sin I con always considered worse than murder was homosexuality. We're born in sin, and we're all sin. All of sin didn't come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Well, that's another sin. Now, it's one we think is pretty serious, but he don't think it is. Then he said, you know, um, this is going to take me some time to adjust to, and you have to understand the generation I came from and the culture I came from. We used to talk about killing gay people. And he said, God threw a curveball at me here, and this is a big test. He said, well, I'm that way. I can't help it. And I said, I know it. And I, I agree with that. I don't not to chide you for that, but to me, it have to, should be a, a, a virgin about it. <laughs> but they never got to the point of full acceptance, which I never really expected. 
So I went back to Moab and resumed my job at the women's shelter as the homeless coordinator. It was there that I decided I didn't want to live in a house, that I wanted to live in a cave. Plus, I was just trying to save money. And I moved into a cave and continued to go to work. And they called me the homeless homeless coordinator. <laughs> And it's like I got this vision of my head just being this weed garden full of nonsense thoughts, most of them negative, just thoughts cluttering my head that were inhibiting my whole life. And I thought, this is the root of my depression. And I thought, I don't care if it takes till I'm 80 years old. Every thought I encounter, I'm just going to pull it up like a weed and let it go. I was like, wow, this is so simple. And I somehow felt like I have a choice here. It's like I'm not a victim of the universe anymore. As weeks went by, I just felt myself feeling lighter and happier till finally I just felt like my depression was gone. And at the same time, I felt like letting go of possessions, useless possessions, like useless thoughts and useless possessions go hand in hand. So it was like this total cleaning of my life. So it took me basically the 90s to do that until I finally got up the courage to give up my last money. And I took the money out of my pocket and I went to a phone booth similar to this in Pennsylvania and I put it on top and I figured somebody will take it. And, and when I did that, it was, it felt really mystical to me. It was I walked out and it, it just felt like freedom, like warm water was pouring over my head. And, uh, and I just felt like, wow, I feel completely comfortable and completely free. I feel like I'm at home. And it doesn't matter where I am, I feel like I'm at home. And liberation. My name's Big Sue, and I'm known as the Mona Lisa of the 20th century art world. Not 37, to Lucian Freud. 30 million. And 30 million dollars now. It's on this telephone and selling, fair warning, at 30 million dollars. It wouldn't really ever cross your mind that one day you would be the subject of the most expensive painting in the world, is it, really? It's not an ambition that most people have. I was flabbergasted when the painting sold for that much. I had no idea. You're sort of the Mona Lisa of modern art, aren't you? I know. I like it when people say that. <laughs> but the thing is, people know more about me than the Mona Lisa due to the modern world of the internet. And does it bother you in the least that Millions of people have now gazed upon your 
body, as it were, 20 years ago. Doesn't bother me in the least. I like these. <laughs> I see, I like, I'm very keen on doing a boring routine job. So you're a schizo? Maybe. Bipolar, they call it these days. <laughs> I wanted to shock and amaze. And uh, amaze, surprise, yes. talk about his girlfriends, it was like talking to a 17-year-old boy, really. His love for women. I was very aware of his addiction to women, but luckily, I wasn't his cup of tea, and he wasn't my cup of tea. Scary face, and he's so old and wrinkly. Oof. <laughs> and apparently he used to kick girls down the stairs if he didn't like them. He'd sort of take them, get them round, he thought he might fancy them. Then if they got on his nerves, kick him down the stairs. Well, I don't know if he actually did, but he told me he did, like I'd be impressed. But, you know, it might be exaggerating for my entertainment. Were you entertained? Of course I was. I'm thrilled by bad behaviour. <laughs> Lucy was a very private person, didn't want people hanging around the house and coming to call him, because he liked working so much and he didn't want to be interrupted. When I was working with Lucy, he said, you don't know where I live. I went, I come here three times a week. And you go, yeah, but don't tell anyone. You don't really know where I live, do you? I work from the people that interest me, and I like working over again from them. Lucy was very picky and choosy about who he would paint, though, and who he wouldn't. Kate Moss, he'd paint, but Princess Di, he wouldn't. Yeah, it was fussy. The main requirement was that you had to be discreet, not say where it was, and you had to be very reliable and on time. You know, she liked more serious girls. Like the Queen? Queen's serious. But I think, it, you know, he went to Buckingham Palace to see her, so the paparazzi weren't hanging around. And I don't think that anyone thought there was a romance going on between them. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Oh, I think the picture of the Queen's absolutely marvellous. So I think it looks really like her. But I don't know if you've seen it, there's a sort of cartoon someone did where they put his painting of the Queen's face on my body, of my painting. And because they're painted by the same person, it looks really good. So I don't know if Queen has seen it. I hope so. Of the city yes, exactly. and how crude men are. Yes. Yes. Excuse me, can you not spray about, your mouth in about. my face? And I think San Francisco, being different at the end of the continent, attracted a lot of people that didn't quite fit elsewhere. We still do. And I always quote Frank Lloyd Wright, our greatest architect of the last century. He said in the 1920s when he came to California, if you turn the United States on its side, Everything loose will fall to California. <laughs> Police! The name of the father's son. They're gonna, everyone will come to you now. Okay, we'll and everything that's down. evil will come now. Everything evil. This is what it is, Sodom and Gomorrah, if you really want to know about it. They like to rape in each other's buttocks and want to be fruitful, but they can't multiply. Well, it sounds okay. like you lived on the street. Thank you for sharing. It sounds sure. like you've been drinking a lot a little while and you, you should be arrested. Yeah, Thank you very I have much. Been drinking. This was our very first uh, uh, commercial street or business street in San Francisco. And it was here that the famous Emperor Norton ended up. Now, he didn't have gainful employment. Joshua Norton appeared sometime after the Civil War. He was wearing Confederate pants, a Union jacket, a broad-rimmed hat with a feather, and he declared himself to be the Emperor of the United States and the protector of Mexico. He had no money. He printed his own specie, as it's called, and he had 25, 50 cent, and one dollar script, which he would go in and pay for things. They were always accepted. Nobody said, I, I'm sorry, what is this, Monopoly money? Come on now. No way. Well, Emperor Nort was so famous that when he died, the city 
uh, Board of Supervisors decided to have all the flags lowered at half-mast. That showed the respect and the honor that this great city paid to one of its true eccentrics and early pioneers. Sarah Winchester, probably the most famous eccentric in California. She married uh, the heir to the Winchester repeating rifle fortune. Uh, they had one daughter. When the daughter was quite young, I think four or five, she drowned in a stream in back of their property. And then a few years later, her husband died. And Sarah felt lost, disoriented. What am I doing wrong with my life? It's my fault that my only child and my husband have died. So she went to a mystic, and the mystic said, we have the ghosts of all the people who've been killed anywhere in the world by the Winchester rifles. And they're all out to haunt you and to ruin your life and kill those near and dear to you. So what you need to do is to start building a home. And as long as you keep building with hammers and saws and workmen around the clock, you will live forever and achieve peace and harmony and happiness. And she starts building and building and building. And as her uh, home grew up from a few bedrooms to dozens and then to hundreds, she would sleep in a different one every night and the servants never knew where to find her. Sarah Winchester believed that only the good spirits would inhabit her new construction and that the evil spirits could not enter. And this was why she kept building and she would do like false walls, false ceilings, stairs that go nowhere, closets where you open the door and there's a blank wall. But when you mention the Winchester name today, everybody knows about it. It's one of our favorite tours because it is probably the most famous haunted house with a great eccentric behind it in all of California. This was the first street in the West named for Lincoln after his assassination. I've had a very happy life. I'm very pleased with where I am today, uh, semi-retired, doing tours, interacting with people. I think because as an eccentric, there's a inner personal sense of satisfaction with your life. And you don't have to be what someone else thinks you should be. You don't have to do what someone else thinks you can do or should do. And therefore, you can be healthier just following your own path in life. I had a, a woman say one time, I want to be like you when I grow up. You know, I said, you can't be like me because I am me. But you can be yourself, but express yourself. You know, follow your own star, your own destiny. That's the advice I give to young people. Do what you think is right and don't ever let anybody criticize you for what you're doing. Never let anybody else judge you because they're judging you by their standards. And that's it, it's their standards, not your standards. Vote for insanity, you know it makes sense. Vote for the monster raving ruling party. Vote for insanity, vote loony, vote for the official loony candidate. I'm not trying to buy your vote, but it is a million pounds. Oh, yeah, thank you. Once, once I'm elected, that will be legal tender. You can spend that. Right. Would you like a million pounds for when you're older? Yes. There you go, look. There you go. Oh. You know, every time we go to an election, we give away a monster raver loony party, Bank of Looney Land, a million pound note. And we will actually honour this million pounds from the Bank of Looney Land once we're elected. A million pound note. Bank of Looney Land, we're the only party that gives you money, you see. All the others take it away. How are you? Bank Looney. If you don't conform to society's rules, then you're seen as an outsider. Well, I knew I was different because when I was at primary school, uh, I suppose I was about five or six, maybe seven. The teacher, I remember the teacher asking all the kids, uh, you, know, you know, Johnny, what's your favourite uh, pop music and that, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I like the, the Bay City Rollers or David Kett, the music of the time. And then uh, I was asked the question, and I don't know what made me say it, but I just, you know, I just came out with German marching military music. And the old class just, you know, the teacher's jaw just dropped, you know. So obviously, you know, I was a non-conformist from a, from a very early age. Hello, how are you? Good, good, good. No one tells me what to say or do, so I'm totally independent. None of the other parties are. And I've got the best policies, I've got the best jacket, the best top hat. I'm a winner. 
I can't lose. You don't really expect to win. Of course I expect to win, definitely. I mean, I, why shouldn't I win with policies like I've got? I've never came last in any election, so I must be doing something right. Lord Jug, who is your companion here? This is Lady Jezebel Luxury Yacht. Yes, hello. There she is. Lady Jezebel. We Very lived silly. together for seven months. What was that like? Yes. Uh, barking mad. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind he's completely barking mad. Um, eccentric is a, a very nice word for it, I think. Yes. There is a huge amount of apathy in the, in the electorate. And engaging young people with the political process in this country is extremely difficult. And the Raving Looney Party is a very, very good way of doing that. And we engage the youngsters, and it actually makes them think about the issues of the day. And although we might put our own slant on it, they actually look then a little bit wider. And if we can encourage them to the vote, and they, and they vote the first time, perhaps for the loonies, but they might actually engage with the wider political process as time goes on. At the moment, our current membership worldwide is 57,000 fully paid up members worldwide, uh, with branches in Malta, Spain, Australia. Uh, we even get phone calls from Russia. <gasps> If smiles was votes, I'd win every time. Uh, and I'd rather have a thousand smiles than a thousand votes. Because there's enough sadness in this world, and if I can make people happy and laugh and put a bit of colour into their life, then more the merrier. Last year, I found a steel drum band, and uh, they accepted me. They support me because I'm the oldest steel drum player anywhere around. It's OK if I only do chords. Musically, are there any eccentrics from the past that you might admire? Or... Glenn Gould, he was probably one of the best known pianists in the 20th century. And what was so unique about him musically is that he focused on Bach and he focused on Beethoven and Mozart, but he was able to interpret their music in a way that nobody else could. He was such a musical genius, and as all geniuses, you know, he had his quirks. Let us push on. I've seen pictures of him where he had to sit in this special chair that was only 14 inches from the ground, and it had to be the same chair. Even if it was warm and it was summer, he would play with a coat on. He was very much of a perfectionistic. He wasn't listening to what other people uh, had to say. And my moods are more or less inversely related to the clarity of the sky on any given day. Matter of fact, my private motto has always been that behind every silver lining was a cloud. I thought it was so sad that at age 50, he did pass away, but it seems like in Canada, he's left a tremendous legacy. There's grants and studios and rooms and various places named after him. And I think that you'll find probably more eccentrics leaving their mark than the person who has tried to keep in step with everybody else. Do you think Darla is eccentric or? To me, no. 
Um, she's just my mom, and this is the norm. That's what I grew up with. That's that's what I know. Um, so, no, I, I just think she's a creative person who's very strong-willed. <laughs> Darla, do you think Kobe's eccentric? Um, no, um, I would say she's more creative, talented, and just we're all very industrious. We're romanticists. I'm a romanticist, and I, I firmly believe in it. And sometimes the male population, you know, they don't understand that, you know, that a man can cry. He can have emotions. And I have emotions when I see, the, you know, my daughter. And I have emotions when I see uh, Darla, when she does something positive, I'm there to back her up, and she does the same thing for me. Darla and Ben, why did you choose to have a hobo ceremony to renew your vows? It made sense. It's so real. It's who we are. It spoke with our voice. May you be well, secure, peaceful, happy, and content, and do it all in gentle kindness. I also know that you have written your own vows, if you would like to repeat those now. They always talk about soulmates. If there's any two people that were soulmates, we've been together for over 55 years. Right from the beginning, you accepted me for who I was. I told you I want to be a mother, I want to be a wife, but I want to have a career. You stood beside me, you split everything equally, and you believed in me no matter what. Darla, you're my foundation, my rock. You've always been an inspiration to me. I love you, I'll continue to love you until the day I die. You are my soulmate. You are my love forever. I love you more today than I need Congratulations. I am here for you forevermore. I love you more today than I did yesterday. I really don't even know what direction my life is going in. As people always say, I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. I really don't. I love you more today than I did yesterday. I am here for you forevermore. Yeah, living without money really is about you have to give up and you have to have faith. You have to have, trust yourself to chance. Like stop trying to control everything and plan everything. You're missing out on the magic of life, which comes by chance. To me, this gets back to the idea of chance being the mind of God. And chance created us and continues to create us. It's an ever ongoing process and it makes us stronger and the more we realize the laws of nature the more we are closer to God and if we avoid it we, we're constantly running away from the laws of the universe we're, we're going to be weak Pilgrim. She lived a fairly average life, housewife, married, middle class, and her husband was in the military, and she disagreed with the military. She just felt very strongly about peace. This is the way of peace. Overcome evil with good, and falsehood with truth, and hatred with love. All of a sudden, she just decided, I'm through with it all, and 
decided she would just walk out with no money and only the clothes on her back. This is a real pilgrimage. It's actually a journey on foot. I don't hitchhike. I walk in spite of all the rides that are offered and on faith. I took a vow at the beginning that I would remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace. Walking until I am given shelter and fasting until I am given food. But she walked across the U.S. back and forth and I think even in Mexico and Canada without money. I know people must think I feel poor because I'm penniless, but I don't feel poor. I have actually great blessings and therefore I feel rich. I have health, happiness, inner peace, things you couldn't buy if you were a billionaire. She started maybe about 50. She walked almost 30 years until she was 79. gotten stopped by cops quite a bit when I'm hitchhiking or walking with a backpack. They often ask me, what are you doing? And I say, well, I'm walking in America. It immediately appeals to that sense of America freedom. You know, th th those two things go together. And immediately it, it breaks down some barriers. This is like my monastery, this canyon. I always feel like when I meditate, it's like there's a oneness with nature that I feel like that same calm that keeps everything alive. It's the same calm that enters me. It's, it feels kind of mystical up here in that way. I used to spend long periods of time up here, and now I rarely spend more than a day or two without going into town. That in itself feels like a good thing to me, like to take what I've learned up here and keep bringing it down there. I also would like to find ways of integrating a simple lifestyle into society, starting with smaller communities that influence greater society. The idea is to make it so it's possible to have moneyless community, so it's not just a one-man show. So I'm just like stepping back and we'll see what happens. And if it, if it comes together and grows organically, then that's the way I would prefer it myself. He knows about Christ in his life. You know, he never married and he was uh, uh, helping people and uh, he never used money. And, and so I thought, well, if that's the way he wants to live his life, that's his business. So this is what I concluded, you know. I thought, well, you know, that stuff is going to be thrown away. It's wasted. Now, I realize that, of course, they can't sell it after its date. But uh, somehow, it ought to be put into use. And so I'm, I'm all for him going in there and getting the food, as long as you don't pick up something that's been in there and gets him poisoned. You know, that was my only concern. But he knows better than that. He knows what to pick. He knows exactly what to choose. But um, we discussed the whole homosexuality thing. Yeah, my dad is quite open about it, and my mom, well, she came around too, finally. He comes around whenever he can, and we just love to have him here. I loved him so much, and I'm not, nothing like that is gonna separate us. 
Thank you for this food for our bodies and all the spiritual, physical, mental needs that we need. We just thank you from the bottom of our heart. I finally came to the place where this is my roots and I have to accept my roots and I'm not going to feel a complete human being unless I embrace the roots that I was trying to reject. You are listening to KZMU Community Radio in Moab on 90.1 FM and 106.7 FM, Utah's only all-volunteer air crew radio station. Solar-powered, community-empowered, celebrating 21 years of live local grassroots radio in Moab Green River. And this is Daniel Suelo. And this program is Turn On, Tune In, and Drop Out. Turn on, tune in, drop out with me. The whole thing's coming down, so let's just get out of the way. Well, I'm not paranoid, there is no conspiracy, but I swear Big Brother's watching me. Turn on, tune in, drop out. Give up with me. So you said it at the teeth to the local stuff, fabulous militia. In camouflage, you'll fight with the local still call you Morticia. Well, we'll find the little meadow high up in the cascades. Baby, we won't ever come down Turn on, tune in, drop out, give up with me